Cheers to you guys. Hope you survived Black Friday. But we're here to talk about Final Order Cutoff, which means it is time for The Last Call Show. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and this is The Last Call Show. We are talking about comic books that are hitting final or cut off this Monday, December 2nd. Full disclosure, the list right now is kind of light, but we're going to give you some picks that we have. But then we have some topics to discuss that kind of tie in with The Last Call, FOC. So we think it'll be interesting. We have a little discussion about it. And you, the viewer, make sure you guys comment and let us know your thoughts as well. But getting into... Last call, final or cutoff. The first book we want to talk about is Batman Beyond number 39. Jack, we've talked about the past few issues on Bolo Show, on FOC, not three up, three down. But here we are talking about issue number 39, hitting final or cutoff this Monday. Yeah, and when 37 originally dropped and we were talking about it on the Bolo Show, I couldn't justify the large prices being paid. Uh, for a Batman Beyond universe kind of sub-character. But I will say, the fact that the reader buzz has maintained all the way through 39 is really a promising sign. Now, you got to continue it longer than a few months, but it's not just a one-shot ep- episode, a one-shot issue. It's not just a, a one-and-done sort of situation. 38 delivered, uh, maybe not from a secondary market perspective, but from a reader perspective. And we've been talking about this since we partnered up on this channel reader buzz can build secondary market buzz everything starts with do the readers love the book and readers have been on board as you've mentioned kind of low-key with batman beyond for a while issue 39 looks like we're going to continue this storyline we're going to get a little deeper into this neo gotham kind of battle for kind of terry mcginnis's place he's kind of going through some things similar to what bruce wayne has gone through where he's got to kind of find himself and what kind of hero he wants to be. But I think we could be looking at a classic story arc here. Yeah, I think the past few Batman Beyond story arcs have been pretty good. This went exceptionally well. I kind of hope that they take this arc, and I think we've mentioned this before, but I'd love to see this arc made into one of those DC animated movies. That's where DC excels at, kills the market on those animated movies, and I think this is perfect material for it. Next book we're going to talk about is another DC book, and we're talking about Lois Lane number seven. Now, we did a short video on here about Superman number 17 and 18 that's coming up. Lois Lane number seven ties into those, don't they, Jack? It does, and I'm on board for this story arc, Brian. Um, We did a little micro video kind of talking about our reader review of Superman 17. I I tell you, I really enjoyed that doing that video. I hope that you and I get more opportunities going forward to kind of do reader reviews and kind of like deep dive analysis of some of these books that we love reading because we've mentioned it. It's all about the story for us. Um, whether, no matter what we're doing with the books, whether collecting or selling or anything, it all starts with reading that book and loving that book. And um, Lois Lane number seven was not on my radar, full disclosure, when we were looking at this book a good month ago. But I really enjoyed Superman 17. Superman 18, I think, is a no-brainer for most DC Comics fans. Um, And with Lois Lane clearly playing a big role in Superman 17, and and we don't want to rehash everything, because the beauty is we've got the video right on the channel. You can check that out and see the role that she plays into issue 17. But with that role, we know that she's a big part of this story. And her part of the story largely, the part that she doesn't want Superman or Clark to be aware of is going to probably take place in the pages of Lois Lane number seven. So I think for context reasons alone, if you're hype about Superman 18, you got to be reading Lois Lane number seven. But I honestly think people will sleep on Lois Lane. Yeah, I think it also seems like people are out to get her for a secret that she something that she knows, which. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like uh, somebody's trying to kill her. Um, it looks like uh, there's kind of a mystery element to it. 
Um, the series, I read the first couple issues and I thought the series was very good. I don't really have a good reason why I stopped reading it. I think it's just one of those, we talk about comic budget. We talk about so many books releasing. Um, but I, I'm going to jump back on and check out issue number seven for sure. I'm going to start on issue number seven because I had no desire to start on issue number one. <laughs> but I like this story arc that's going on. So this one I'll pick up to read and then maybe I'll go back and read the other issues. Here we have the final order cutoff for TMNT 101. This is going to have your regular cover, your Kevin Eastman B cover, but then there's also that 1 in 10 variant to be on the lookout for. But 100's a big issue. I usually like the ones that are right after a big issue because you see the attention die down on them. But with me not knowing what actually happens in 100, I'm anxious to see. There's, the solicit makes it sound like something big is going to kick off on this issue. Yeah, my the solicit leads us to believe that the all the issues that kind of sprung up in issue 98 where we had kind of the mutant kind of spread genesis amongst New York City doesn't really seem like it's going to get solved by issue number 100. Um, I think a lot of that is going to play out further into the story and that's going to give us kind of where we're going to start off on this new arc, this new kind of the next hundred issues, right? And TMNT has been a book that has plotted their stories with incredible longevity in mind. Like they're not, these aren't like three issue arcs. These are, these are arcs that have been planned out, even arcs within the larger story. The Jenica story, for instance, was planned out from issue 51 and played out from 51 all the way to her becoming a turtle at 95. So I bring that up to say this. A major event happened at 51 right after 50. I'm not guaranteeing that that's going to happen again with 101. But kind of like you said, attention dies down. Less copies get ordered. Less stores do store exclusives. And that's the time when publishers like to sneak in something new, something different. This is where I'm going to be paying attention for first appearances. This is where I'm going to be paying attention to major changes in character. And one thing that makes you feel good and secure is they just solicited a new solo miniseries for Jenica. So all of our fears right now about Jenica going away seem to have been um, seem to have been dispelled. And I think that we can all take a deep breath if. If you're sitting on Jenica first appearances, I, I think she's a character that looks to be here to stay for at least a considerable amount of time. And if you are interested in that one in 10, one thing you might want to check with your stores is see about if order and cover all three covers. Sometimes they'll cut you a deal if you order it, cover A, cover B, and the one yes. in 10 together, rather than if you just wanted that one in 10 by itself. All the great covers. Well, I say all. Oh, I haven't seen the Eastman. I've seen the cover A and I've seen the one in 10 and they're on the screen right now. But... 101 looks like it's going to be a good issue. That's why it's in that final order cutoff. So like I said at the beginning, the list was fairly light so far for what was available for final order cutoff. Those were our picks. But as mentioned as well, we have a couple of topics that we wanted to kind of have a discussion about. So Jack, what's the first one we're going to talk about? Well, the first one relates to why the list is light in the first place. And it's, it's about this holiday schedule, Brian. I'm actually excited, Brian to get a chance to talk about some things surrounding FOC that's less about the actual books and more about kind of the process and what goes into this, these orders. Um, Marvel, as the major producer in comic books, they stacked multiple weeks worth of FOCs into certain weeks. We actually had a hard time just narrowing the list down and not doing entire Marvel lists in the last couple weeks. Um, and it's funny that they're doing all of this to try to avoid having – they didn't want people this weekend happening to get orders in because they know that this weekend is going to be a big sales weekend for stores. And they know it's a big family time. And I think that while they were trying to avoid missed orders, that's exactly what they got. They got a lot of missed orders. There were a lot of reports of Marvel number 1 books being incredibly low ordered, Tarot number 1. And Hawkeye Freefall number one um, are two books that were reported to be very low for Marvel number one advanced reorders. Doomsday Clock number 12, the uh, yellow blank, outpaced both of those as well as most of the 
um, Thor and Star Wars regular priced variants um, in advanced reorders. Now, advanced reorders, that's a store that already put their order in before FOC, and now they're running back before that like deadline clicks off, and they're getting whatever copies are left at Diamond, whatever copies. Most of the time, there's like a 10% overprint after FOC um, for in-stock copies, and the stores are already buying those copies up now in anticipation of these books being good. Now, the top two books on the reorder list were Star Wars and Thor. That would be expected, right, because those are going to be the big books. But there was a little panic, apparently, amongst Marvel that some of their titles – underperformed and i i think they're going to have further problems with the fact that the release dates on these books are christmas day and new year's day yeah i think christmas day new year's day those are always hard days i mean people are off but really christmas day i don't know what comic book stores i think there's going to be a shift there obviously for when the, when the comic yeah. book stores are open and get those orders in but we also know that when we talked about the bolo list for this week on the bolo show how light it was christmas week is notorious for having a super light week for comic books. So I'm anxious to see how that goes, especially with these reorders. So getting back to that yellow Doomsday Clock variant, we've talked about those blank color variants before, and I think you're also seeing a rise in popularity in that because it was regular priced, wasn't it? Yeah, regular price, open order. When you're seeing all these Marvel incentives, one in, I'm talking high ratios, yeah, where they're the same thing, but they're so much more in price. Well, here's a chance to get Doomsday Clock. Although it has delays, phenomenal story. I think it's one that's going to be talked about down the road by fans and readers alike. But that's a book that people are going to want as well. And it's a regular price book. I don't see people wanting to spend hundreds of dollars for the same thing for Marvel for a book that may or may not mean that as much. Right, especially once you know we saw it in Baltimore – um, looking at getting remarks done on the um, Frankie's exclusive purple Joker year of the villain. Your real cost when you're getting these remarks done and these these sketch variants is actually the artist fee. So if you're if you're looking at an artist fee and you're factoring in like you're saying these high ratio prices, um, it becomes almost cost prohibitive to even create these awesome works of art. So I think these cover price and these store exclusive ones are going to be the route to go for a lot of uh, collectors who are, you know, original art fans and like to get those blank sketches done. Even the upcoming Thor has one of those high ratio blanks. Yeah, I think it does too. But speaking of Thor, that was the second topic you wanted to talk about, right? Yes, I've got my Thor glass in hand just for the occasion. But the Thor number one, the Downey Cates book, is the talk of the market right now. Um, advanced PDFs went out to retailers. And immediately I started seeing – again, I, I'm the social media guy. Um, I ran social media um, for the previous site that we worked with. Um, I'm heavily involved in what Brian and I are trying to do on social media for Simpleman's Comics. And I, one of the contacts that I try to make is with a lot of retailers – and a lot of retailers started posting immediately on Twitter about how amazing Thor number one is. Um, the buzz is incredible. And the beauty is it's not like we talked about Venom number 20 on the uh, um, the uh, Bolo show. It's not buzz coming from Donny Cates now. It's buzz coming from people about Donny Cates. But in this process, apparently a store retailer has put a copy of the PDF on one of these like PDF viewing sites um, – for access, open access, essentially pirating the issue after FOC, and he left his code that they each have like a like a code on the back. I'm an account or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and you and I get uh, every now and again from publishers, mostly independent publishers. Full disclosure, we'll get um, you know a P advanced PDFs, and that's something I'm always cognitive of is not sharing that with anybody because it you know they'll they'll be like the signature when you sign on well, type and thing. You, you betray someone's you betray someone's trust when you right and those relationships are invaluable right the relationships you make in the marketplace um, you can't get that back once you burn that bridge and Donnie was rightfully very upset about this um, and this has been a whole saga on Twitter so 
to, to give you the long and short of it, well, this, he's very this young. ties into more also because before right before this happened, there was the whole there's a bunch of stuff going on Twitter between creators about the piracy of books before this as well, like people reading on the sites yeah. books without buying copies. So to see this on top of the conversation that's been going on, on on Twitter kind of adds to the frustration, I'm sure, on the on the part of the creators. Yeah, and especially like Donnie has was very strong stance of anti piracy. So this could have been done um this could have been done despite him because he took such a hard stance. Um, it could have been done. The truth is retailers have been doing this for a long time. They've been doing this to manipulate the market. And then there were reports that this actually came from a speculation group. Now, I don't want to say speculation group because at the end of the day, it's one person who did it. Um, so apparently th- this came – this was a, from a speculation group. Donnie has since put tweets up saying that it was a battle between two speculation groups and and he doesn't think that it was like malicious or even real. The reality is though – there have been screenshots posted about the discussion about it where someone admitted to it and took uh, the fall for it um, through like – I don't know if it was text or Facebook Messenger. Either way, it's a messy situation. And it's part of why, Brian, I really love that you and I are removed from that entire um, speculation group kind of community because we've both been in speculation uh, group chats and groups where some of it is very public and some of it's very private. And you don't really know what goes on in a lot of these groups and you can be insulated in your group and then there's other groups and what's going on there. And the bottom line is the relationship between retailer, publisher, um, writer, these, these are sacred relationships and they really shouldn't be violated. We talked about this when we had the recalled comics at DC Comics. Um, I understand why Donnie Cates was so upset about this situation. Um, I hope that he's right and this was just some fake news thing, but I don't think it was. Um, and I got to be honest with you, my BS detector feels like it's really questionable that this happened after FOC. Um, we we caught a lot of flack for doing this show when we initially came up with the concept of the show. And I think we've shown our core audience that we've done this show to try to help and educate and bring attention to the FOC process and how it can work for you as a collector and then how that also benefits the industry as a whole. Um, what the people who don't like us doing this, they want information kept to themselves till after that date. And then the idea that they could possibly then release that information after the fact and do more than we're doing. We're just talking about books we like and our opinions on them. This was an entire book available to read, to build hype, and now you can't go back and order it FOC. So no matter how many copies you went and ordered after you read that, because the argument's going to be, well, speculators get hype on it, they go buy a bunch of copies. It's true, but they buy a bunch of copies that were already ordered. They're not buying new copies. They're not increasing the print run, which, yes, a speculator's going to turn around and go, that's the point. But that doesn't help Tony Cates, the guy who wrote that book, created that book, has waited his entire life to get to write Thor number one. Um, I just think ethics have to come into play, Brian. And it's unfortunate to see that this kind of thing happening within the hobby um, and this kind of manipulation. And the idea that this could affect how Marvel or any other publisher handles advanced PDFs is disappointing because we know that we rely on them to be able to accurately – a lot of times report and talk about books um, to be able to do the shows and the content that we do um, and to be able to, you know, help get the word out about certain books. So um, it's a, it's an unfor- whole unfortunate story to take a place, especially on Thanksgiving. It's one of those things that you see from the outside looking in. So you don't know all the details or everything. So yeah, on, on the face of what we know, yeah, it's disheartening. It's kind of, you hate to see something like that happen in the hobby, but it's gonna it's it's gonna happen if not this person, someone else to do it. I don't agree with it, but I think also that if that diamond code or whatever is out there was on there, I hope you know whatever happens between diamond and that publisher, whoever shared it, it gets taken care of, and that's like the right thing to do. There's nothing we can sit here and disagree with it, but yeah, 
I think it's wrong. That's kind of why we pivoted away from it, just because it's like, hey, I want to get back to why we like comics, why we like reading comics, what's great about the stories, what's great about the creators, what's great about the publishers. Yes, there's some tangible, uh, natural tangible, where there's going to be some value market investing talk within our conversations. But this right here is the main reason why we have decided to kind of pull back from that and talk more about the hobby in general. Right. And then if you hear us talk passionately about how excited we are about like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 101 and how we uh, have high expectations for that issue, doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be right. But if you then decide that you want to invest in that book, by all means, more all power to you. But we're not your comics broker. We don't want to play that role. We we're in this because we love it. We wouldn't spend the time doing it if we didn't love it. Um, and we have enjoyed getting back to the core of what we kind of got into comics in the first place for. So I will say there was a part of me, Brian, while all of this saga was playing out on social media that I said, I feel really good that this has nothing that I have to even really be concerned about. I can kind of be a spectator from the outside and, and watch it all. And like you said, we don't know all the details. It's really, it's really an unfortunate mess. I think something happened. Yep. I don't, th I don't think it's a hoax. Something happened. Um, and I do hope it gets cleaned up. I will tell you, Brian, I don't have a lot of faith in Diamond cleaning it up because Diamond stands to profit. They don't cut accounts off very easily. Um, Marvel will need to get involved for anything to happen. Marvel will have to put the pressure on Diamond. So we'll see if that happens. We'll see if we ever even honestly get resolution publicly to this. This could be handled privately and none of us could ever, um, could ever even find out. But... You know, it is what it is. Let us know in the comment section what you guys think for sure. About yeah, if you're even aware of it, or if, if, if um, I mean, sure, if you follow Donnie Cates on Twitter, you're you're aware of it, and the, there's been other conversations going on. Um, we just thought, yeah, it was something to discuss. Find out what the you you the viewer thought of this as well. Yeah, and absolutely no disrespect to anybody involved or accused, or you know, that's why we, yep. you know. It's net, we're not accusing anyone ourselves. Um, you know, we were we were very aware of all the things that have been talked about on social media. But you know, for us, the topic is topical, and it plays it's into this FOC, and it it a lot of it factors into a lot of the talk that surrounds FOC and in the whole process. Um, and it's it, there is a part of the hobby that the average you know collector doesn't get to see. Um, and I you know I felt like this was kind of a blessing that we had a small week this week that we could kind of talk about all these other events that play into FOC. So there's the last call and my last word. I'm still excited to pick up Thor number one because we talked about it on last call last week. Yes. And I am too.